data is such a is such a driver, right? To kind of drive decisions. And um, basically, now we have like so many avenues to um, you know collect that data and make sense out of that. To Holly's point earlier, where you know it, either it could be machine driven analytics or someone actually manual trying to kind of intercept that data and try to make sense of that. So um, for those who um, have, I'm hoping everyone, the NASIO app will be throwing a question out there in a minute, so I'll give you some time to kind of get that fired up. But um, what I do want to um, talk about is the user-centered design process, the, the overall process, and how, where that fits in in what we do for like any project. So how do you all see that basically either flying tandem, tandem with what other projects go through with the different milestones or like how, where do you place that? Do you want to start where we go? Okay. So I do think user-centered design is really important, but often projects are under pressure to get things done to show visible results. And if you spend a number of hours you know, researching and then you have nothing to show except for research, but your CIO or your executive leader is expecting to see something interactive and web and online, that can be a challenge. Um, there are trade-offs that I think you have to judge the whole way through. Um, in our case, because of the timeline and the, the sunsetting of our website, um, the old CMS, uh, we really took the attitude of get things into the hands of our users as soon as possible. We did that initial three month research, but then we just kept pushing things into production to get users to get their hands on it and then follow the data, do more um, interviews and keep going. So I think it's important at the beginning and then honestly you have to get those, those muscles in shape for feedback and consistently get feedback and build it into your cycle all the way through. True. So for us, I think there's a, there's a little bit of a difference between application enhancement and, and application modernization. So we try to focus our UI resources more on the application modernization. A lot of times our users don't know what they want their new system to do, and so we leverage our UI teams to really help drag out those requirements for the hard to understand, where do you want to go? They know conceptually where they want to go, but the detailed requirements are a challenge. And so we are leveraging our UI teams to help with requirement, almost as a supplement to business gathering and BA work, and that has proven to be really successful. Our UI and UX teams not only help our businesses understand what they want, but then they take that information, translate it to the business application, the application developers, and then they also work back on the back end to do usability and uh, compliance with visual impairment as well. That's, that's really a good point, yeah. Both, and for us, it's, it's truly wherever we start a project for us, the process begins right at the early conversations, you know, like we talked about. And in our case, I just featured an app example that one of our key agencies was getting ready to invest in. And clearly, they passed through all those questions, but the process didn't end there. Like, it really kind of stayed through the whole uh, development process, the design process. And even though that was implemented, we did fine with some user testing um, where we saw where, wow, okay, the, the behavior is probably not exactly aligning to what we were expecting with that. So I do have a um, collage of some of our actual user testing videos. So um, if I could please request um, you all play that video from back there. So what I'd like you to do first is to make a payment as a non-custodial parent. That's the first thing I'd like you to do. Okay. The first ask. Signing in now. My user ID, I'm putting it in. All right, I'm open on the first screen. The answer for the payment method. That's perfect. That's as far as we're watching it right now. All right. Um, what I'd like for you to do is to change your address. Okay. Kind of what screen you're on and what you're doing when you're changing your address. I just have uh, three survey, very small, a couple of questions.
just saying that. Um, now the confusing part is it, it, it never gave me the it never gave me the password it just gave me a user ID so I don't know what the password is I don't know how to capitalize on my phone sorry if this was my phone I would screenshot this so I would know the uh, user ID it just keeps going back to sign in it's not telling me it's correct or incorrect. I, I only got like, I don't know, it's like a half a bar, like one bar, so it's probably acting a little longer. What, uh, what screen are you on now? Um, it looks like it's the same one that asking for the password and the... Uh, ID again, it is. I can't see the bottom. Yeah, I already got no internet going on. Y'all see that? The only thing is, it's not telling me what I should do next. Okay. Should I start over? Am I missing something? Am I, is something incorrect? Um, and I do need that when I'm doing stuff like this. And to contact them. We go to frequently asked questions. It may be a button that say contact. Uh. Well, this is where I um, usually throw the phone. <laughs> Clearly not the response that we want, right? When we are designing and developing something. But you know, some, of the, some of the cases really made things very obvious to us, we're like, how are we dealing with some of the older phones? Because clearly, you know, our testing labs might have very different phones than the real users. In, in one case, you probably, if you have noticed, like that person had not even taken that plastic flap that said, this is where the volume is, this is where the power is. Um, people, people have very different levels of technical challenges. Um, 90% of Georgia is broadband enabled, but about 20% of our population actually has no access to broadband. So we have to also think about a lot of those issues as far as networks are concerned. So um, I, from a user-centered approach, when we tested that, we, we found so much wealth of information that we can go back and then include that to make the app a lot better. Um, so having said that, I would, I would love to um, have our first polling question up there, if you all are ready with your um, app. We would like to know, how are you doing with the user centered design process? Okay, that's great. That's awesome. Um, so obviously, as, as you all um, you know, can see, uh, we have some uh, tidbits to share up here on the stage, but by all means, you know, do find us if you need any um, help going forward as well. But I'm actually really surprised to um, also see that 10% have like never heard of a user-centered design process. This is great. So welcome, and we'll get this conversation started. So as we jump into the next part of this conversation, I would still like to kind of lead in with our next question so we can then start talking about that. How many of your websites are mobile-friendly from a percentage perspective? And this, this could be your state overall website and department websites. That is interesting. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we, um, in Georgia, we did our Georgia.gov in 2012. Um, we made it responsive. And um, you all you did such a great job recently. Yeah. Um, with mass.gov. Yeah, we, we made ours mobile responsive too. And I think what's really interesting is to watch with the user testing videos, how people really navigate differently mm. on a phone and a desktop and uh, the different types of people that tend to um, engage with them uh, on those various uh, channels. So did you want me to show one of our user testing videos? Please, yeah. So there is nothing more humbling than watching a user actually use what you build. <laughs> um, we'll see if I can play this. I might need help from the back. So uh, what you see is that people really scroll very quickly on their phone. Uh, so when we told people we weren't going to put a lot of um, 
pictures on our website, they were like, oh no, but it needs to be beautiful. I'm like, how many of you are on your phones and actually stop and look at a beautiful picture? I guess unless it's Instagram. Um, but really, when you're just trying to do something in between dropping, dropping kids off at soccer, you're scanning and you're, you're clicking through it pretty quickly. Uh, and a simple thing like the way a name shows up on a button, such as for us, it was unemployment. Um, there's a button that said login for UI, which to our our team, we knew it was going to be a problem, but the unemployment folks insisted that's what it needed to be. So we went ahead and then um, did user testing and showed them the user test. And what you see in the video that we weren't able to pull up is that the person just keeps going past it because they don't know what UI means, mm -hmm. which is so obvious. But mm -hmm. that was really easy to then help convince the business partner, you need to change this. Users need to understand what we're trying to do here. Uh, and then when you look at it, someone navigating on a desktop, it, it is a very different experience. They do take a little more time and scan everything, and they mm -hmm. want to have less mouse, cl mouse clicks. So balancing those two is pretty tough. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a really good point about the pictures, right, or the, the photos. Um, we have been in so many conversations. Um, oh, it looks like they're just yeah, yeah. showing a video they're now. Just showing it. The We've been in so many conversations where everyone leads in with like, we want like this really nice picture of blah, blah, blah within Georgia. And you know, to Holly's point, like, yeah, but your traffic, 70% of your traffic, if it's on mobile, that picture is not gonna really have a place and impact as it would have on a desktop. Plus also from a budgeting perspective as far as not budget as in money budget, but our, um, you know, what, how many KBs are we dedicating towards that page to actually download on your phone, right? Well, we, we see people struggling with low bandwidths and they have to pay um, to download things. Why, why are we kind of subjecting them for such large images, right? So we, we literally made some um, calculations where we've shown that if we just optimize some of these pictures or get rid of some of them, we'll be saving about at least $20,000 for overall users. So um, it's, it's fantastic to kind of like do that testing ahead of time mm -hmm. so you actually have numbers, that data to follow. Yeah, yeah. And, and the tools to do it aren't that expensive. They're, they're pretty accessible. We've had a similar experience in New York. So in addition to the infrastructure, networking, and applications, we've also centralized website deployment in our web and Y team. And we've got a pretty good process for intake of that work and uploading it to the New York State platform. We have a great digital team, which has also streamlined the look and feel. So every single website that you go to, not every single one, we're about, we have about 20 to 30 websites, um, but all of those that are in the WebNY platform all look and feel the same. So no matter which agency's website you're at, it looks and feels similar. But some of the interesting experiences we've had is we have a dedicated team of digital uh, look and feel people as well as the developers for the websites and they know what modern websites look like. They know what mobile devices, how they are gonna react best on a, mobile, on a mobile device. And what we're finding inside the agencies, they're not used to that. And they don't like that look and feel because it's not the website that they remember. And so that is an internal struggle we have with developing the websites that we know people expect versus the websites that our workers are used to dealing with. Yeah. So that is something that we encounter quite a bit as well. Yeah, great. That's pretty interesting and, and yeah. It's like data that drives all these decisions. And it's key to kind of collect that and to Holly's point you know, earlier where the tools are not that expensive. Like the crazy egg tool that Holly showed about the um, heat maps where you plug that in on your key pages and you can see actually where people are clicking, where they, how they are scrolling. I mean, that's like literally something like 15, 20 bucks a month, mm -hmm. right? And um, it's easy, it's accessible. The other reason the feedback um, and getting it you know, data-driven is really important is when you're having those hard conversations with your business owners about single face of government, this is what constituents want, this mm -hmm. is what they're looking exactly. for, mm -hmm. you know, this is why we don't have any pictures or whatever you're putting forward as a hypothesis that then you test, they come back and they say, well, I think this, and you're like, well, do you have any data to back that up? Mm -hmm. Did more than one constituent call you or is it just one cranky constituent? And they're like, you know, you sort of have that push-pull, but the moment you say, okay, here's 30 people we tested that have gotten your services before, and this is what they told us, told us, then it turns it into not a my gut versus your gut, it's we're learning together from the users, let's figure out how to serve them better. It's a very different and more productive conversation to yeah. be in. And data really helps with the conversation because it, it kind of bypasses the whole opinions, right, where someone asks for something that you know it's not 
best for the users, but then you have data to kind of support your conversation. Um, so that actually is a good segue for our next polling question. I just love how everyone's been honest. Yeah. That's, that's like the best part of anonymous surveys. Yeah. Rarely, 30%, that's great. Um, so it, it's really a good um, kind of question to, uh, I guess, you know, ponder upon where um, you all did the mass of redesign and you just showed the app that New York did. I'm, I'm pretty sure like you had some data to show why the state needed to uh, you know, invest in that app. Yes. And, uh, and that was like a great example, by the way. I mean, that's exactly where someone really needs to invest in that. We had, a, well, we had a lot of fun with that application. There was, a lot of it was, uh, was just user-driven, although the data does take the emotion out of the conversation. It was so paper-based and so heavy that we were able to really figure out what was gonna work best for that uh, client in, a, in going forward. Another place where we also use data, and it's not specifically about usability, we do a lot of data analytics on the back end of what the application does. Because mm. a lot of time, clients will want you to design, I think we saw in your cartoon, the comfy chair with the sun shining behind them. But when you sort of present the data about, here's how big your application really needs to be and comparing it across other applications, it becomes very clear that they don't really need a Cadillac. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes much less expensive. So that kind of data is also very helpful when we talk to our clients, because they want a very big and robust application, but they don't want to spend a lot of money on it. So that data is also very helpful in bringing some realism into what they actually need mm -hmm. and to design something that's going to work well for them, that's supportable and performance enhancing without breaking the bank. That's good. Um, I have a couple of examples. and. Um, I, I put the, uh, the uh, AV people at a disadvantage because I was going to show a couple of things. They were interactive, and so we were strategizing at the last minute. That's why you're seeing a couple of these glitches. But can we go back a few slides? I wanted to show, oh, maybe I have access now. Um, I wanted to show the slide right before we have the discussion questions. Uh, and so one of the things that we're up against right now is how do we present data to our content managers? Um, we have people who are epidemiologists and park rangers who are, um, yes, that's the one, thank you, mm -hmm. who were asking to look at data and information in the CMS system and improve their page. I took IT out of the website business and all the other agencies because we used to have an old system that someone would write something in a Word document, email it to an IT person that would then cut and paste it into this horrible system. No wonder our website looked like the way it did. So. Now we are pushing the website to the communications teams or people who are on the front line serving our constituents because they understand the plain language and how to talk to our constituents. So in terms of using data, of course, many of us use Google Analytics. Google Analytics is actually quite hard to work with. It's hard to read. You cannot, have, you cannot hand that basic dashboard to anybody that you get out of the box. And so what we're doing right now is we're working on a profile for what a conversion looks like in public sector. Conversion is a term that's used in the private sector for what the goal is on, in what you're doing. So on Zappos, the moment you hit, you know, purchase those shoes, that's the conversion for you. And you better believe that every click you do on Zappos or on Amazon is driving you to that conversion. We need to be that ruthless and that thoughtful about driving our constituents to what they need, whether it's information or applying for a benefits program. And so what you need to do, what we're, we think we need to do, is we are going to start tracking all this information with dashboards and then grading the different pages. Uh, and we're creating a success profile for different types of pages. I'll give you an example. Um, one of the things we look at is um, traffic. There's also findability. Uh, but one of the things people often do look at is time on page and how long someone's on a page. Well, if someone's on a page for a long time, that might be the right thing if it's something about a regulation that they have to read through really carefully or it's a how-to page with you know 20 steps they need to get through. But if they bounce really quickly off that page, you know that page wasn't what they're looking for versus a page that's just a navigation page where you want to see them bounce out of there really quickly. So you can't just look at one metric for your whole website or one metric for different pages. So we're putting together various dashboards that look at um, data and bring them together in a, in a way that our different um, content management managers can see it on every single page. They can see how they're doing, and then we make recommendations to how to change that. 
That's awesome. That's something similar what we have done is when a content manager logs into their website from the back end, they see the top 100 pages that get all the traffic, yeah. but they also see the bottom 100 pages that get no traffic. Yeah. So they're like you know, constantly reminded, do you really need these? Yeah. And if you don't, then there you go. That's your strategy right there. But your point about like trying to understand data, like a quick example, I have something that we recently did with an agency where they came to us. They came from a .com domain and joined the Georgia Go platform. And within like six months, they were really concerned that their traffic had dropped a lot. And um, when you know they were so upset, we were like, "Well, we'll take a look at your data. We'll we'll try to find some you know reason why that's happening." And the, what we saw was that while they were on that .dot com domain, a lot of their traffic just came from all over the nation. And when they realized this is only Georgia specific information, they bolted. But now that they are you know their domain says Georgia.gov, we started. They actually had like an uptick in the Georgia traffic, and their time on page had actually quadrupled. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm like, you know, that's the right metric. You should really be happy about this yeah. and not be concerned. So yes, data, data, and data. Like the way you actually kind of prioritize what is key for you is is truly what the data should be able to support. That I do think data visualization is a key part for the user centric mm -hmm. design because data is great, but if they don't, if people don't understand what it means, then it's not particularly useful. Data is information, but the analytics is what makes it intelligent. That's right. And so yeah. we've really um, been leveraging dashboarding a lot to put that data back in the hands of our business users and empower them to make decisions yeah. instead of having the IT professionals kind of guess around the edges. Yeah. Uh, so visualization is key, not just to the application and usability, but it's also starting to really empower the business to make decisions about technology, which is really helping us um, deliver what they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one, one more point on this. Yeah. We did um, pilot it with 150 different pages, um, and we were able to show an 80% increase in all but a handful of them. So a lot of the changes that we wanted to put into place were really simple. Uh, and the other thing is, when you're about to put out a dashboard, we needed to be prepared to be able to explain to the epidemiologist, the park ranger, what they'd need to do to drive that number up. Um, and so you also need to understand, if you're going to put out a dashboard, how people can affect the change that you're looking for. Otherwise, it's not helpful if it's not actionable. So to That's build true. Point. Yeah. 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 Um, I know we have about another uh, 11 minutes or so, but I do want to address the other part of any of our digital presence, which is apps. Mm. And uh, we do know that um, agencies sometimes kind of are in a position where they have to decide, uh, should they build an app, should they piggyback on an app that's like, already existing, um, or they should just be focused on responsive uh, web apps. And you know, I kind of put the slide up there earlier just as a reference, and I'll be more than happy to share that with anyone if you all are finding yourself in that conversation or you're the decision maker, uh, that slide helps. Um, what are some of your ex um, you know, um, experiences where if you were in that conversation where you chose not to do an app, or if you did choose to do an app, like what was the supporting data behind that? Behind picking between a web app versus a mobile app? Right. Mm -hmm. It really comes down to that user, the UI and UX teams and the mm -hmm. requirements gathering. Um, we're lucky that we have frameworks that we're building that we can leverage across many agencies, mm -hmm. and we have examples like our plant inspection app. We can walk them through that and see, would this be useful to you? Would something like this be useful to you? Having those prototypes available and having other agencies to borrow from really cuts our development time. We don't have to develop a prototype, ask if it's needed, and then go back to the drawing board. We have assets that we can reuse and share and use that as an example to drive the conversation forward. So that's a benefit to having a consolidated application shop. Awesome. By the way, is, your, is it open source, your application? This one is not. Okay. We were hoping to steal it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to show a chart that is, um, maybe I can do it this way. No. Uh, that if you go forward, it's a two by two chart. Keep going. Um, so one of the things I thought was really helpful is when you are trying to think about a model framework for your users, in addition to the questions that would be asked by your UX researchers and designers, can you guys go forward uh, one or two more? Um, there, you can create a two by two matrix of on the Y axis, you can have, there you go, you can have the subject matter expertise, and then the X axis, you can have the frequency of visits. This really helps you think about the different audiences you're working with. For our first year, we really focused on that lower left-hand corner 
um, our average constituents and businesses uh, who really have low subject matter expertise and come to our website infrequently. That's what we really focused on. Um, the next set of users that we're really focusing on are actually in the upper right-hand corner. They are what we call our power users, people who use the website for their job. Um, they're subject matter experts, but they come to our website a lot. That is an opportunity possibly for apps, um, but it's also an opportunity to think about how we might change our navigation, and we're currently doing some research on that. But I find this very helpful because you wouldn't necessarily dedicate a lot of resources to build an application for someone who is a high subject matter expertise, but only comes to your website once a year. Mm -hmm. But if you're in the lower right-hand quadrant, yeah. and you have someone who has low um, subject matter expertise, but comes frequently, such as unemployment or um, SNAP benefits, that's probably worth building an app, because they, you don't want them to have to tra traverse your website over and over again. If they're just going to download something and be able to do what they need to do, that makes a lot of sense. We found this as a really helpful tool to interrogate ourselves about where we're starting and making those decisions. That's very true. And there are so many um, other factors where are your users going to be in an area where they would be struggling with network? How much of your app's reliance is on network where they can download data? and they can use that, or is that something you're choosing to do, like a hybrid model where you're constantly going to be like pinging? So there are like so many like factors where you kind of have to be pragmatic about that, but also, yes, like the, the core aspects, like what is the business need? Mm -hmm. And if it can be fulfilled with a web app, there is absolutely no reason to invest in a mobile app. Because it, it's a true investment, right? Because it's kind of like you have a lot of um, effort to build something, and of course, we at least in Georgia, we have like an equal set of users using iOS and Android, so we have to have for both. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Windows is not too far behind. So, like, you have like three different streams now for the future updates every time OS updates. Um, you have to invest in that. That's so, a, um, that's a really interesting slide. I think we run the risk of building applications, whether they're web based or, or not, or mobile, and building the application for the subject matter expert on the inside to help them process, mm -hmm. um, process faster and deal with their day-to-day -day job. So what we try to always ask is not just what's the business need, because right. the business will say, I need to process faster, I need to understand, I need to get through my, my backlog, but ask that next question is, how is that going to impact the citizen or the business? Right. Because we tend to stop at, how do we help my client? My, client are, my clients are 45 agencies, so if I can make them happy, then I'm successful. But really, what my client wants is to make life better for the citizens and businesses of New York State. So we always have to continue to push and ask that question, why are we doing this not just for the operation and efficiency of government on the inside, but on the efficiency and operation of government and how that impacts the citizen and business? And we've been really focused on adding that to our vernacular. That's very true. Um, so let's, let's move to the next poll question. Um, what are your plans? Are you currently building or planning to build an app, either users, um, you know, your citizen uh, facing or inside facing? It's an interesting juxtaposition with how many people are doing user-centered design. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I can say the uh, grants and licensing portfolio, which is what developed the plant inspector application, I can tell you that right now in their portfolio, they have a dozen applications that are currently under development. So there's a lot of activity in this space. Um, our clients want them, and we're lucky that we have components that we can reuse. Okay, cool. Well, I think that was kind of like pretty much the agenda. We really just have about four minutes for uh, questions. So maybe we can answer like a couple of questions. So are there any questions in the audience? Hi, thank, uh, thank you, Mark Raymond from Connecticut. Do you, do you have an, any interesting approaches for, as you make these transformations, uh, dealing with the individuals who were very much wedded to where their content used to be? Um, and, and, you know, whether it's media, whether it's sort of individuals or experts of the, hey, you've disrupted my world. Can you talk a little bit about any innovative approaches to that? Sure. sure. Uh, you can go in the. Uh, are you? Do you mean internally or externally? Both. Both. Okay. 
so let's see. Internally, so I did endless road shows over the past year. I'm talking like I went to every organization two to three to even four or five times and gave a road show over and over again. And one of the things that I thought was really important was disrupting the way that people were thinking about it. Because what I found is that people were sort of outdated the thinking the way that the customers were engaging with us. They had based it on sort of when the web came about and they started to work in the workforce. So if they were younger, like a millennial, they were sort of on par with where they are. If they're my age or older, um, then they would tend to think about it, okay, well, you go to the home page and then you navigate down, and if I'm not on the home page, then no one knows I'm there. And so what I ended up doing is I would have these, I would the, stop my talk in the middle and say, okay, it's gonna be 95 degrees tomorrow in Boston. Your wife or husband is texting you and you need to get a kiddie pool before you go home at five o'clock tonight. Who's the first one that can do it and tell me where you're gonna get it and how much it's gonna cost? And so for a second, everybody sort of looks at me and I said, go, who's gonna do it? And then everybody pulls out their phones, and then they go, they go on, and someone will raise their hand. I said, okay, what did you just do? They said, I got on my phone. I said, yes. And I said, what did you do? They said, I went to my web browser. I said, yes. And I said, what did you do next? They said, I Googled it. I said, yes. And then I said, then what did you do? And they go, well, the information just came up. It said right there, I could get one at Home Depot, and it cost $16. They said, you didn't even go to the website, did you? And they said, no. I said, that is the future of our websites. Mm -hmm. That has nothing to do with what you just told me you think your, cons your clients do. Mm -hmm. So let's you know, step it back a little bit and rethink about where we are in this world in a search environment. So I think experiential learning was really helpful in jolting them into the fact that we, they think one way at their job and they are doing a completely different behavior at home. Um, we also, uh, I talked about the data and showing them the user videos, that was also helpful. But we did disrupt a lot of people's lives that we call our power users. That's why we're going back and doing a lot of research. And we knew we were gonna do that. We did it not necessarily on purpose, but we had to focus our resources for the mm -hmm. first year. Um, and I have some research on that I can share with you later, but um, we're in the process of trying to follow up with them and fix what we disrupted for them. I agree wholeheartedly with Holly. In New York State, we compare ourselves to Amazon and Google. That's right. Because that's what our clients and our, and our citizens expect of where they are at home. And they expect the same thing when they're getting services from New York State, whether they're a nursery who's going to get the feedback from an inspection or whether they're applying for SNAP benefits, they want that ease of use and they want to replicate their experience with government that they have with commercial partners. So we do go through that with our internal clients, with the agencies. We also talk about that change in, in generations, that we're probably, I don't know if we're 50-50 quite yet, but 50% of our constituents are used to an older way of, in, of engaging online, and 50% of our constituents are used to a new way of engaging online through mobile devices. And we're starting to get many of our agencies thinking they want to change their reputation. They realize that they really need to change how they present themselves. So it's a little bit of education, marketing, uh, jolting them into thinking like this is how you're going to behave because this is how you want to engage people. This is what they're used to and we want to mimic that. And we've had success with that. I can just add like one last thing, you know, and I've got like literally time just ticking seconds now. Um, we went through like a capacity building within Georgia, and you know the key content managers who are like really kind of the drivers of our websites. We made sure that they are put through training. So it, it actually came to like my um, team to train them for the right tools. So um, I'll be more than happy to kind of talk to you about like what we did, we, the training that we put them through. So they're comfortable using all these new tools and uh, in a sophisticated system for that. But um, that's yeah, that's where we're going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.